have another terrific guest for you. And what I love so much about doing this live show is so many of my guests have been recommended by other guests. This next guest was recommended by Dr. Judd Brewer, who I had the privilege of interviewing for the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. And then on this live show, he says, you got to interview my friend, Brad. And I always do what the doctors tell me. I really appreciate you guys being here so much for the lives, which I created when the sheltering in place started, just to create a sense of community and connection. I love when you guys post who you are and where you're from, and you're all getting to know each other. So my guest today is Brad Stolberg, and he is the author of Passion Paradox and Peak Performance, and I can't wait to hear his expertise and see if he can tweak it to what I do to see if he can help my people succeed in the area that I'm most passionate about. So please welcome Brad. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, thank you so much. You know, I, I like I'll be honest, I didn't have time to read your book, but I did listen to your podcast and I'm enjoying it very much, especially the episode on on social media. I thought I really got a lot out of that one. Thank you, Chef. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I, I do. I, I'm, I'm a real podcast person. And I think because I can listen in 2.0 so I can get like twice the work done in half the amount of time. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, you talk about a pa you know having passion for peak performance, and what I do for a living is I work with people trying to lose weight, and yeah. they, they've, in their own terms, they failed so many times. How can they develop a passion for that, and how can one develop a peak performance for their health-related goals and not experience burnout? So the first thing that I think in the realm of weight loss is that is so important is to acknowledge that weight loss is very hard. And if it were easy, everyone would be doing it. And there are all sorts of um, genetic forces and environmental forces and early childhood forces that go in to put someone at a weight that they're at in any given moment. So I think the first thing that gets in the way of individuals on a weight loss journey and really on any journey to make a significant change in one's life is seeing failure as failure. So I don't really love the word failure. I don't think that there's such a thing as failure. I think that there is information that you get and you take that information and then you adjust going forward. Um, that to me is very different than failure. So failure is an attack on oneself. Oh, I can't do this. And then there's so much negative self-talk that comes with that. And that self-talk tends to be very judgmental. Um, and it's that kind of judgmental self-talk that actually just kind of kicks, we're basically kicking ourselves when we're down. Whereas if you can reframe failure as something that, again, is just information, it loses that sense of judgment. So I would, I, I would zoom out and I would say, hey, weight loss is really about a journey of being your healthiest, best self for the longest time possible. So the end destination is when you die and we're all going to die eventually. Like there is no, oh, I lost 50 pounds. Now I'm there because then you'll probably bounce right back. So this is really about a journey of developing habits that are healthy, that will nourish your body, nourish your mind, nourish your soul over the long haul of your life. And there are going to be ups and downs. And if you expect there to be ups and downs, then there aren't such things as these devastating failures because it's, oh, I learned. Maybe what you learned is that you move too fast too soon. And maybe what you learned is that you thought you could still surround yourself with certain people in a restaurant setting, but it turns out that you can't. That's okay. That's just information that you take going forward. So I would make the goal less about weight loss and more about a journey of healthy living and healthy eating because you can't fail at that until you die because you can always change course, adjust, redirect. And then once you get on that path, failure just becomes information. I love that. You can't, you can't, as long as you're on a journey of healthy eating, you can't fail until you die. Instead of failure, what if we just say not yet quite succeeded? Yeah, not yet quite succeeded. Or um, just as is, is, is our mutual friend Judd Brewer would say, just be curious about what happens. Um, because what the research in, in peak performance shows so clearly is that we think that in order to be really great performers, and this is for elite athletes or the 50 pound overweight individual that wants to get their BMI to a healthier range. We think that we gotta be really tough on ourselves and we gotta keep pushing and we have to take personal responsibility and we have to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. All of that can be true and often is true. But you know what else is true is that we have to be kind to ourselves because doing hard things is hard. And if we're not kind to ourselves along the way, as I said, it's that negative voice is almost worse 
than the acute momentary failure itself. Um, so I, I'm a big proponent again of zooming out and maybe you say it's an acute failure or a misstep, right? If we're gonna use the analogy of a path, we're on a path to healthy eating and healthy living. And of course we're gonna have missteps. Um, but just the tone of that, right? Oh, I took a misstep, interesting. Or I've taken lots of missteps. That's so different than failure because failure quickly becomes, I'm a failure. I think Whereas you can't say I'm a misstep, like it's just an experience that you had that didn't work out as you thought it might. I think you're right, Brad, that people have the wrong goal because if the goal is just weight loss, that's not enough to sustain them. But if the goal is to live healthfully for the rest of their lives, then it's a lot easier to, to have that as something that you do, right? Yes. And, and it's interesting because something about having a goal that is very particular on an external result, like weight loss, is a lot of people think that once they achieve that goal, they'll feel great. But you actually don't. You feel kind of crappy because then you have nothing else to look forward to. So if your goal for the last six years of your life was to lose 80 pounds and you finally do it, well, you still have to wake up and put on your pants the next day. It's not like you're gonna go straight to heaven. Um, so it, it, there can be almost this sense of emptiness after we accomplish big goals, because then it's like, well, now what do I do? So again, if you zone out and you think of it as a path, as a practice of being healthy, it's never ending. You lost 80 pounds, then it's great. I'm gonna now focus on putting the healthiest nutrients into my body. Or maybe it's, I'm gonna really learn how to cook. I've got a great coach to teach me that I'm talking to right here. So now that's gonna become the practice. But it's all wrapped into this larger practice of healthy living, healthy eating. Yeah, you know, um, we have a comment here from well, Facebook user is the name. I beat myself up all the time for falling off the wagon. How do we articulate to people there's really no wagon? <laughs> Yeah. So again, I would, I think that it's, it's, it's a mindset shift and it's hard, right? I mean, I, I'm assuming that that, that question that was, Oh, we got a special guest. I love it. I was assuming that that question is probably from someone that grew up in a Western culture where we're taught again, that we got to like really go hard and got to get back on the bandwagon. Um, for me, and I have this negative self-talk, I I'm very fortunate that I haven't struggled with weight, uh, in a long time in my life, but I have tons of challenges. And I catch myself having that judgmental voice of, oh, crap, I failed. And what I try to do is I try to use that as a cue to just step back and say, all right, this is what's happening right now. This is what's happening right now. I'm doing the best that I can. What did I learn from this? And then how can I get back on the bandwagon? And it's important. The how can I learn from this part is really important, too, because, yeah, if you're super kind to yourself, but you don't change anything, you're going to get the same result, which might be a misstep. But it's shifting the attitude from one of harsh judgment to one of learning. And then you take the things that you learn and you try again. Wendy made a good comment. It's the difference between buying the car one and done and filling it with gas ongoing lifetime. Love it. Um, something that a word that I really like is um, the word practice. So to me, a practice means something that is ongoing that you do for the sake of doing it itself. So again, the goal of weight loss, I need to lose 50 pounds. To me, that's a goal and goals are fine, but I prefer to situate a goal in a larger practice. The practice is I wanna be as healthy as I can and I know that there are gonna be ups and downs. And once you frame what you're doing as a practice, it just takes the tinge off those failures, which ironically helps you get back on the quote unquote bandwagon or back on the path faster. Um, if you think of yourself walking this path, that's a never ending path. And sometimes you get knocked off the path if you can be kind to yourself when you get knocked off and learn from it and then get back on the path, that's better. Because, um, all right, that might have been a little bit woo-woo. For the people in your audience that are like, this guy's too woo-woo, I'll make it very rational. Beating yourself up for failing does nothing to help you succeed. It is just a waste of time and energy. And I bet it actually makes it harder for people to try again. Totally, because you've got this like negative voice in your mind and, and, and you know better than me, but there's all kinds of research in nutrition and weight loss that shows that when you have those um, negative, like when, when you let that negative talk take over, that's when you actually tend to like engage in more of the bad behavior because you feel guilty, you feel shameful, all of those negative feelings. So you can't control what you think. If you're used to telling yourself these negative stories, your brain's gonna throw that, it's gonna throw that crap your way. So it's just like watching the thought being like, oh, like there's negative self-talk, that's interesting. But what I'm doing is really hard and I'm going to get back on the path. Yeah. 
you know, it's interesting you use the word practice. When you think about it, doctors practice medicine, attorneys practice law, yogis practice yoga. So maybe we should just say, you know, we're practicing weight loss. Totally. I mean, I have a writing practice. I don't view myself, like, I don't say I'm a writer. I say I have a writing practice. Um, I have a weightlifting practice uh, because I want these things to be long-term and enduring. Um, Yeah. And, and like to make it really concrete, so the mantra that I like to use and that I often use with my coaching clients is um, this is what's happening right now. I'm doing the best that I can. And that kind of snaps me back if I get lost in a negative story where I'm judging myself. Um, very different than weight loss, but this would happen all the time to me in, um, in early fatherhood. So the baby would wake up middle of the night, two in the morning, sleep deprived, shouting, and my brain would spin all of these stories. Oh, this is so hard. This is impossible. What kind of mistake did we make? I can't be a good dad. Oh my God, I'm thinking what kind of mistake we made. Does this mean I'm a terrible person? And on and on and on. And then I would say, you know what? Like, this is what's happening right now. I have a crying baby. It's hard to have an infant. I'm doing the best I can. I'm just going to change his diaper and go back to sleep. And, and, and you get out of that story in your mind. Um, and if you think about that negative voice in your head when you, when you have a misstep, whether it's in weight loss or anything in life, it's just like a crying baby. So you just have to deal with it kindly, put the diaper back on, and then get back on the path. Christina, she's saying, oh, that's really good. I judge myself often. And then I judge myself when I judge myself. Yes, that's the second thing. It's like then you judge yourself for judging yourself. So it's just about like taking this. I view it almost as a soft step back. And it's like, oh, that is just like my brain chattering. And I'm just going to let it chatter, but I know that I just have to kind of gently nudge myself back onto the path. Well, Jan says that when she messes up, she gives up. And I hear that from a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's where I, I have such frustration because I don't know how to re-inspire them to keep trying when they feel in their own minds that they have failed so many times. Yeah, so this comes up all the time. Um, so I'm, I'm not very active on YouTube, but I'm quite active on Twitter. Um, so I often tweet these like very concrete practices and trying to help people. And this is a question that comes up for me all the time on Twitter is when I fail, I lose my inspiration or motivation. And it's a hard mindset shift to make, but I think this comes back to not really viewing the goal is this concrete endpoint, but more is this ongoing practice because then you don't fail. So here's an example. Um, I'll speak to something I know really, really well. Let's say that my goal and all I want to do is have an essay published in the New York Times. And I try and I try and I keep trying. I've made eight tries and they all get rejected. Well, then I fail. And of course I feel like crap. Uh, Had eight essays rejected, more likely to give up. If I can shift that mindset to, I am like, my practice is writing this is one avenue to pursue it, then it no longer becomes this like dead stop failure. Again, it's just something that didn't go well and I try again. Um, And I almost think that like it's this paradox that the more you focus on the process of weight loss and not the result, the more the result takes care of itself. Um, So obsessing about a result is just gonna lead to all kinds of anxious energy and self-judgment and struggling with failure. The more you can say, this is my process. I'm going to do everything I can to stick to it. I know I'm going to make missteps. And when I make missteps, I'm going to tell myself, this is really hard. I'm going to get back on the path. That leads to the most enduring chance of success. It's like the people that focus the least on success are the most likely to achieve it. Because instead of worry, being worried about whether or not they're going to be successful, they're in the process. They're present for the journey. They're taking the steps that they need. And keep telling yourself, like, it's really, uh, am, sh- can I swear on this show or no? Yes. <laughs> well, well, I was going to say it's really effing hard. Look. So like the more that you remind yourself that, and again, like no, you know, no one, very few people became overweight because one day they decided that I'm just going to sit in front of a TV and eat nothing but pizza all day. People have genetics, people have families, people have cultures, people have friends. There are all these factors. So you are where you are. What you're doing is really freaking hard. Of course, you're going to fail a lot because it's really freaking hard. And once you have that expectation, it just makes it easier to get back on the path. You you know, I I like to interview psychologists and 
a few of them have said something very similar about focusing on the process, not the outcome. But I've never heard before that the people that focus most on success are least likely to achieve it. But I really believe it because I had this experience once in my life in my 20s where I really wanted to win this Scooby-Doo doll at the Santa Monica Pier because I have a Scooby-Doo collection. It was one of the big ones. You couldn't buy it in the store. And they had this game, uh, the water game, where you, you squirt the water gun and the thing rises. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were great games. Those are all rigged anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So I'm, I'm playing this game and I'm throwing money every time and I'm losing. And I'm thinking, even if it is rigged, somebody is winning every time. I mean, that's a fact. Somebody is getting a prize. And so I stepped away from the game and I watched and I watched for about an hour and I tried to notice who was winning. And I noticed that the person that was winning was the one that was looking at the target and just squirting the gun at the bullseye. Whereas everybody else was mm. side by side to see how everyone else was doing. And then I went back and I did that and I actually won. Yeah, I love it. That's also a great analogy because um, it hits on another really important principle, which is the, 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 the temptation to compare yourself to others often gets in the way of your focus on the bullseye. Uh, and I imagine that that's true with weight loss, just like it's true with writing. If I sit there and I'm like, oh, you know, all these other people had New York Times bestselling books and I haven't yet, A, I'm not gonna feel good. B, all that mental energy and time I'm spending ruminating about that, I could actually be writing or reading or like doing the thing. Yeah, Amy says, I love that. Focus on the process and the results take care of themselves. I mean, I would imagine that most actors would love to win an Oscar, but when they go to the set every day, I'm sure that they're actually doing their, their scenes and they're not just thinking about the Oscar. Totally. And when you focus on the end result, it, may, it sets you up for a lot of an emotional roller coaster because you don't get it and you're going to be really down or you get it and then it's like, okay, well, what comes next? You might feel really empty. Again, a lot of people that have these big results that they're so focused on and they finally achieve them, they actually feel really empty after. Maybe they feel good for a day or two, but then they feel empty because it's like, okay, well, now what? Um, so, but if your process or your practice is to you know, be on this healthy eating journey, well, that goes on forever. Absolutely. And maybe it shifts. Maybe the first goal for somebody is, um, okay, like my milestone on the path is I want to lose 50 pounds. Okay, you lose 50 pounds. Then my milestone is now I want to put back on 10 pounds, but I want it to be muscle. So then you have this, other, but it's all part of this broader picture of healthy living, healthy eating. We always heard that an, ac an acronym for the word focus was follow one course until satisfied. Mm, I like that a lot. And then have the next course ready to go. Right. What yeah. do people though? Well, you know, if I don't try, then I can't fail. I mean, yeah, but then you can't really live. Like have skin, having skin in the game. So, all right, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the poets. Um, there's a poet that I love named David White. And he talks about to really care about something makes you very vulnerable. Because when you really care, you have skin in the game. And if things don't work out like you thought they would, it hurts. And that's just the price that we pay for really caring about something. It's part of the bargain. And I would argue that to live a life where you do really care about things that are important to you, knowing that it's going to cause you pain to really care is better than never really fully engaging in the things that matter to you. Uh, but it's hard. It's a lot easier to say that. When you really care and something doesn't go well, it hurts. That's why it's so important to have a community around you, to have people that you can open up with and share with um, that make those blows a little bit harder. Um, but yeah, I mean, the ultimate, right, is like to really love somebody makes you super vulnerable because you can't control that person. That person eventually might get sick. There are all these things. So taking it back to weight loss, to really care about it, yeah, it's gonna hurt because the more you care, the more those missteps are gonna hurt. But I think it's better to take on big goals that are in alignment with who you wanna be and your values than to just sit on the sidelines and not play the game. Yeah, I agree. Jessie has an interesting comment. She says, I think focusing on failure is sometimes a way to excuse yourself from continuing to make the effort. Mm, love it. I got nothing to add, Jesse. We're on the same page. It, you know, again, like it's a lot easier to, not easier, but it doesn't feel good, but your brain, it's, you, I can sit here and just talk about all the way I failed for two hours, two days, two weeks, two years, but that's a lot harder than like getting started again. Um, Cause what happens in the past, like it's done. Yeah. 
what is, what is yeah, I know you, you, you've done a lot of research and writing on burnout. What is burnout exactly? So I like to define burnout as a state of psychological and physiological fatigue and apathy that can often be accompanied by a feeling of dread about doing something, but also a feeling of dread if you're not doing that thing. So you're just kind of stuck. So in a work environment, burnout might be, the last thing you want to do, Chef AJ, is you know make your social media post and write another book. You're tired, you've been working way too hard, you've been burning the candle at both ends, you, you just dread waking up and doing it. So you try to take a day off. But on your day off, you start having all this angst that you're not doing it. Well, I should be posting. I should be doing an interview. Uh, the people might wonder why I'm not here. What, what if this impacts my book sales? So you get stuck in this bind where you're kind of dreading doing the thing. But if you don't do it, you also experience dread. And to me, that's like the telltale sign of being in a position where you're, you might be experiencing burnout or you're very close to experiencing burnout. Yeah, that, I, just, I just, I interviewed a doctor the other day and he was saying that in his profession, there's really a high rate of burnout. Tons of burnout amongst physicians. Yeah, so I was, uh, that's why it was on my mind. You have a great quote on your Twitter feed. I'm looking at it, pay close attention. The times that you fail are much more instructive than the times that you succeed. Mm. Very yeah, nice. I love your opinion. I mean, again, that gets back to our earlier conversation because success can be instructive, sure, because like you're learning what you did well, but the times that you fail, like that's where you learn about the potential shifts that you can make and it teaches you something about yourself. Like, can you be kind to yourself in this moment? And again, people think in, um, that people often think in like dualistic ways, especially in behavior change. And I think it's terrible. So let me guess that your audience is familiar with one of these two schools of thought. There, and I, I said this a little bit before, but I'll say it a different way. There is the pull yourself up by the bootstraps, personal responsibility, get your act together camp. I call that the, the hard ass camp. And then there's the woo woo camp. Love yourself, everything is structural, nothing's your faults, it's all society's problem. Both of those are wrong because both can be true at once. You can love yourself and you can have all kinds of structural issues that got you to where you are. And you can take responsibility and do hard work. And it's when you marry those two things that you have the best chance of making a behavior change. Like I can't stand in the world of like performance. It's like, oh, you're a hard ass tough guy versus like you're talking about woo woo self-compassion. But the best performers can be a hard ass tough guy at the same time that they can love themselves. And that's what makes them great performers. So it's about taking these different dichotomies um, and, and putting them together. And back to that tweet, that's what failure teaches you. Failure teaches you, can you pick up your bootstraps and get back on the path, but can you love yourself and realize that what you're doing is really hard as you do that? You know, a lot of people think of people as overnight successes because they only seeing the end. They don't see all the other stuff. Yeah, they don't see it. Um, it's a topic that I love to talk about. I've written about this quite a bit. Like we look at people and we think that they had a breakthrough, but no one has a breakthrough. Breakthrough is the result of weeks, months, years, decades, sometimes a lifetime of practice. And it's just that we don't see that. When the person tweets the, you know, the picture of them winning the gold medal, we don't see all the times that they failed. We don't see the hours that they were too depressed to get out of bed because they thought they'd never do it. We only see the picture of the metal. Um, so yeah, there's no such thing as a breakthrough. It's, it's a lot of hard work, ups and downs um, along the way. Absolutely. Louise says, I just love this guy. That's terrific. Oh, thank you, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> she says, what do we do when we experience burnout? So what do we do when we experience burnout? Oh, look, I got my special guest. Yours was joining us earlier. Oh, that's so cute. This is Bryant. Um, <laughs> so what do we do when we experience burnout? The, 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 the number one thing to do is to rest, which is really hard because again, you have that kind of double dread and a part of it is, oh, I'm falling behind if I don't work. So it often can feel like forcing yourself to rest. And that doesn't just mean take a half day off. That can mean take a couple days off or a week off and to totally unplug. 
So no emails, no social media, just really disconnect. And a common experience that people have is the first couple um, hours of that, or even the first couple of days, people feel worse before they feel better because they feel all this anxiety. Oh, I'm falling behind. I'm not, I'm not checking email. What could be happening that I'm not aware of? But then eventually your brain kind of gets to this point where it's like, oh, it's kind of nice to just not have to worry about this stuff. And then you relearn how to rest. And then what you can do when you come back to work is you can set up these intervals of stress where you're working really hard in true rest. So not rest where you're kind of constantly checking your email or constantly on social media comparing yourself, but rest where you're totally unplugged, where you're watching a movie and you're just watching a movie, or you're listening to music and you're just listening to music. Um, so it's, it's, it's a nudge to force yourself to rest. And then the second thing um, is about, again, like re-entry. And I, I talk a lot about you want to balance stress with rest. So it's okay to stress yourself, to challenge yourself, to put yourself in really hard situations, but you have to follow that with periods of rest and recovery. Um, so, you know, there's research that shows, back, back to your world of weight loss, that individuals that had really demanding days that had to use a lot of willpower during their day, they tend to break their nutrition plan that evening because they're basically out of willpower, right? They had such a stress, 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 and then sticking to their nutrition plan is stressful. Um, so it's like, you know, something that I say is it makes no sense to decide that you're gonna lose 50 pounds, run your first marathon, get promoted at your law firm, have your first baby, and run for school board all in the same month. It's just too much in the pressure cooker. So how can you kind of pick the spots in your life where you're gonna go really hard, you're gonna quote unquote stress yourself, and then make sure that you have enough open space so that you can rest and recover. What are you coaching people to do right now during these uncertain times? Mm. So it depends on the client. Uh, most of my coaching clients are entrepreneurs, executives, or physicians. Uh, I actually coach more, more doctors than any other group. So it's a little bit different for me because the doctors have a very different lifestyle right now. Um, but it, it, for me, generally speaking, I'm always touching on what I call first principles. So first principles are things like sleep, nutrition, uh, movement, like exercise, um, all these things that are the foundation that allow you to show up and perform at your best. Cause I think when times get really challenging, we tend to lose focus about those foundational elements. But if that foundation is not there, we can't really do anything on top of it. It's like trying to build like this beautiful penthouse with no foundation. When there's rough weather, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. Um, so for me, the foundation is always, as I said, it's physical movement, sleep, nutrition, uh, and then community is another thing that I put as a big part of the foundation. Because during tough times, it is so helpful to connect with others. And obviously that's a challenge right now because we can't connect in the ways that we're accustomed to. Um, so it's about finding other creative ways to feel like one belongs and to connect. That makes sense. I, I, I'm, I've been doing this show, I, I didn't it mean for this to be a show, it's kind of happened by accident. I was trying to reach out to my group and it went out to everyone and people were liking it. So I was doing it one, two, three times a day and I'm starting to feel like if I don't slow down a little bit, I'm gonna burn out. So uh, starting Wednesday, I'm going down to one broadcast a day. <laughs> yeah, that's something that happens. It's interesting in my coaching clients, I never have to push them forward. I always have to hold them back. So really driven people that are creative, that like their work, they don't get into trouble by not pushing hard enough. They get into trouble by pushing too hard. Yeah. Um, so I get that. But I agree with you. You know, you know, sleep seems to be the most overlooked thing by, by so many people. You know, diet, exercise, diet, exercise. Without sleep, you can't do either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is one thing. I will not compromise my sleep for everyone. If, even, if, even if people are over, if it's, if it's 10 o'clock, I'm like, see ya, I'm going to bed. Yeah. And it's a very, it's a very American way to think about it, but here I am in America. Um, so I tell people that it's helpful. You don't, a lot of people think of sleep as something that they do and they're sacrificing because they do it. I could be doing more work. I could be reading more books, but I think that sleep is an integral part of your job. So it's not that you could be doing more work. It's that sleep is a part of the work because you can't show up 
and do whatever you do. I don't care if you're an athlete, an investor, a physician, a lawyer, or a nutritionist, you, or a parent. You cannot show up and perform at your best if you don't sleep. So sleep's a part of your job. And once people make that mindset shift and start thinking about sleep as a part of their job, they actually start sleeping because they prioritize it. Yeah. This is an interesting uh, comment from Dina. I wonder if you get this with your clients. I worry more when my weight gets closer to my goal weight because I think it's going to go mm -hmm. back up again. I worry more so when I'm closer to my goal than when I'm farther from it. That's an interesting, um, that's an interesting observation. So yeah, I do have an analogy. So in, it's a sports analogy. So in sports, when a team is really close to winning, they often go into what's called the prevent defense, where the whole point is to prevent the other team from doing anything. But a prevent defense often backfires because everyone's on edge. They're like, oh crap, it could go wrong. We're so close, it could go wrong. So back to holding that angle a little bit more loosely, I would say to Dina, ask the question you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say to Dina, try to let go of that. Like, obviously you're, you're, you know, you're on your program, you're weighing yourself, you're doing whatever you need to do to stay on, on the path, but try to, try to not hold the goal so tightly. Because then again, if you focus on the process, it doesn't really matter if you're 28 pounds away or one pound away, you're just focusing on the process. So you're just staying on that path, process, process, process. That makes like, sense. why would you change what you're doing when you get super close to the goal? Just keep doing what you're doing. But I get it because it feels really good and you don't want to lose. It's like the, um, it's like the singer that finally makes it to Broadway, but then chokes up because she gets so tight. So we want to prevent ourselves from getting tight. And one way to do it is just, you know, focus on the process. So in, in the example of the singer, I would work on, well, pretend that you're not on Broadway, just sing. So for Dina, it's like, well, pretend that you're not only two pounds away. Just keep doing what you're doing. You know, it, do, do you ever uh, coach people on performance anxiety? Because I'm, right now, nobody's going anywhere. Every conference that I was scheduled to speak at was canceled. And I've been speaking publicly for over 10 years, cruises, spas. and But I also do a lot of pro bono work. And I find that the more I get paid, the more nervous I am. And mm. often the worse I do. So a lot of times I'll do these jobs like, and you know, maybe at a church or something where I'm not getting any money and I'll hit it out of the park. Grand yeah. step on. And it's almost like the more they pay me, the worse I do because I feel like, oh my God, now I got to really do a good job. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really astute observation about yourself. And it makes total sense. Um, so the more that you can, again, try to release from that external stuff and you just show up and give a talk, um, the better. And like, it's normal to get nervous before a big event. That's part of like being a human. Right. I get nervous before big talks. Gina wants to know how you became an expert to coach doctors and entrepreneurs. So um, I've had a really circuitous path into this kind of coaching. Uh, out of long time ago, right out of college, I went to a large consulting firm and I was put in a group that did a lot of um, organizational leadership. So I started working with organizational leaders that way. Um, but my interest was always in health and performance. So I was very fortunate. I, um, I got a scholarship to graduate school to study public health. And that's when I started shifting into more thinking about health and performance. Um, and writing about these topics. And then after my first book came out, um, more and more people just started asking me if I coach. And at the time I didn't, and I was honest. I said, no. And they said, well, will you try? And I said, I really have any background. I'm a little bit hesitant, um, but uh, they kept pestering me. So eventually I tried and I got pretty good feedback um, and then gradually built a coaching practice. Um, and then why and how healthcare. So there's a large uh, healthcare system where I live in Northern California called Kaiser Permanente. And it's one of the biggest employers in the Oakland area where I live. Um, so it was, um, it was A, just a large organization that had a need for coaching. And then um, I love the notion of helping people, but I suck at science and math, so I can never be a doctor. So if I, can con if I, if I have these coaching skills and I can contribute them to helpers, that makes me feel really good. Like, what is a coach and how do you coach people? It's like, hey, good job. And I mean, because I always wondered what that is because I guess I've never had one, but it sounds like like something that could be very beneficial for most people. So the way that I like to explain coaching is that um, if you think of having a therapist, 
to help you if you feel like you are not functioning, get you back up to functioning. A coach takes you when you feel like you're functioning pretty well and helps you grow and improve and take it to the next level. Um, so that can encompass personal habits, that can encompass leadership, it can encompass the actual work itself. So in my coaching practice, I'm not an expert on being an entrepreneur, or I'm not an expert on being a doctor, I'm not an expert on being an executive, I'm an expert on this set of principles that I can help people figure out how to apply to their own lives. Right. You know, when I think that's a great answer, by the way, I, I appreciate that. I, and I realize, you know, I do have coaches in my life, but they're often called something other than coaches. For example, mm. my improvisational comedy teacher, he's really a coach. Coach in improv, yeah. Teacher. They they really are my coaches, but I never thought about it in that way because they're doing for me what you're doing for your clients. Yeah, and I, I have a coach myself. Um, I just, I think that coaching's great. Like, it's so helpful to have someone that can, Oh, he froze. Well, that happens from time to time. For you, really candid feedback. That's right. You froze for one second when you said, I have a coach myself. Oh, sorry. I, I was saying I have a coach myself, and it's just so helpful to have someone that can give you um, candid, objective feedback, help you see what you don't see, um, and really grow with you. Because um, it's, 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 you know, it's surprising how much we think that we see, but we get, we only see this and a coach can help us see this. Do you think for certain things, like for example, weight loss, a coach is more effective if they've been through it. Like I myself used to be obese. So I understand what the people are going through rather than some doctor that's never struggled. I think it depends. Um, I think there are people that have been obese that are terrible coaches. And there are people that have been obese that are great coaches. And I think there are people that have never been obese that are terrible coaches and some that are great coaches. Um, personally, I know that I like to work with someone that has had that experience because there's a level of empathy, um, that you can't get otherwise. And I think that's important. That, that makes a lot of sense. So Joy says, I'm having no problems with eating well, but what with starting back up with exercise, because I know how much work and how much effort it's going to take. How do you get yeah. started again? That's a really good question, whether it's weight loss or exercise or eating well, how do they, once they have that pause, yeah. give them the momentum to like get back, take another step. So you just got to do it. That's the short answer. Um, the longer answer is this. So I'm going to like slay a sacred cow in self-help. So self-help says you got to feel really motivated and inspired to get going. What the research shows is that's not true at all. The research says it's actually the opposite. You get going and then you feel good. So often the number one thing that gets in the way of somebody getting started is them thinking that they have to feel good to get going. So they try all this positive self-talk and getting super motivated. But if they don't feel super motivated, then they just assume, well, I guess I can't get going now. But again, years and years and years of psychological research and in science speak, it's called behavioral activation. I call it mood follows action. So just get started. Um, I can tell you that when I fall into ruts with habits that are important to my life, um, for me, I'm fortunate. Exercise has become like brushing my teeth. Like I can't live without it. But I try to meditate and that is not nearly as easy. And when I fall out of a habitual routine, the first couple of weeks back, it's not fun. I'm not motivated to do it. I don't really want to do it. But I kind of just force myself to get started. And then afterwards, I end up feeling better. Or at least I give myself the chance to feel better. Um, there are a couple other things you can do with exercise. I mentioned just community is so important. So if you can engage with other people in your life and um, have them hold you accountable or try to exercise with them, even right now over Zoom, um, you, can, you can set up a camera. Um, so community helps too. That's great. Because, um, Valeria is saying motivation doesn't last. If everybody had to feel like doing something to do it, no one would ever go to work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mood, again, it's like mood follows action. And there's two kinds of tired, because we did talk about burnout. So there's tired when your body is actually tired. And then you should rest. But there's tired when your brain is kind of trying to convince your body that it's tired, even though it's not. And that's the kind of, oh, well, I could just stay in bed, or it's raining out, or we're in the middle of COVID. 
so I could just kind of stay in bed and I'm feeling kind of sad. So I could just wallow in my sadness. That to me is a cue when you're like, all right, like brain, you're trying to get me to stay in bed, but I'm not actually tired. So I'm just going to get going. And if I don't feel good, great. Then like no cost, but I'm going to give myself the chance to start feeling good. Um, Mood follows action. I had a coaching client almost tattoo MFA from mood follows action onto her arm because that one simple shift changed her life. Cause she used to think that she had to feel good to start doing something. And she read all these books on how to motivate yourself. And I said, well, what if you just feel like crap, but you start doing the thing anyways, and let's see what happens. And sure enough, she got motivated by doing the thing. Well, it's true if you have, it, you said waiting to feel good to do something when it's the doing something that's going to make you feel good. Yes. And this is backed by years and years and years of research. Um, so I'm someone that struggled with OCD and depression. And the therapy that was most helpful for me is this behavioral activation. So it's not trying to change the way that you think. It's not trying to change the way that you feel. It's acknowledging that you might feel really shitty, but you still get up and you start exercising or you go run that errand that you have to run. You just start doing the stuff and it doesn't always work, but you give yourself the chance for your mood to turn around. Yeah. Wendy says, you don't have to start big. You can exercise for 10 minutes at the beginning. You'll, you'll want to do more in time. That's what I used to do. Like when I had had injuries and to get back, I spin, that's my, my yeah, yeah, yeah. And to get back on the bike after it's been six weeks, it's like, you really don't want to do it. So I would say, look, I only have to do it for one minute. And then at one minute, I say, I only have to do it for five minutes. Next thing you know, I'm watching a Netflix show. It's 60 minutes and I did it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Love it. And exercise, you know, I don't know your audience and how much, how much you guys talk about fitness, but um, there's also a misconception that exercise has to be like grueling workouts where you're dripping in sweat or you're at a CrossFit gym. Um, exercise can just be fast paced walking. So like you don't have to kill yourself and if fast paced walking sounds really hard, it can be talking to a friend or listening to a podcast while you're walking. So it's just movement. You know, I think one of the reasons that I've been, you know, by the way, like if people that like see me now, like, oh, what do you know? You're not, you're not overweight. And you exercise every day. I, for 52 years, I didn't. And I think one of the reasons I stick with it is because I hate the feeling of having to go back and do it. You know what, I, you know what I'm saying? When, it, when there, there's gaps and that I know how hard it is to get started again. So for me, it's just easier to keep doing it than to have to go through that. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Inertia. Inertia is so strong. That's what, that's the word I was looking for is inertia. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's real. Um, and when you're out of inertia, you, you like, like, again, it's like this kind of mood follows action, this friendly nudge to get back, to try to get back on the, the, the bandwagon or to, to use our, uh, to use our words, to get back on the path. Right. Well, it's like, it's like, it's hard to get an airplane off the ground. That's the hardest thing is takeoff. But once it's flying, it just kind of goes. Totally. Yeah. So uh, Sherry says, how would you advise a person who sleeps not restfully, talks in their sleep about work, and cannot get out of work mode? Mm. So, so, so I'm assuming that, oh my goodness, sorry, one second. It's funny, I had the YouTube up so I could see questions come in too, but it just started talking to me. Um, so, so, um, so I'm assuming that Sherry's asking about someone other than herself, because um, she wants to advise that person. Um, and I think that, again, it kind of, none of this stuff is easy. So it comes to setting an expectation that you're going to feel worse before you feel better. It's kind of like breaking an addiction in some ways. Um, and, you know, I'm a big, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, I love my work. And I know that if I, and I'll tell you where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm kind of thinking Mr. ago. So I think the best thing to do, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart my answer to this question, is to focus on changing the environment around you. So if this person understands that it would be helpful for them to unplug for a bit, well, then you've got to make it easier to unplug. So I'm somebody that once six o'clock rolls around, I know that if I have my phone on me, I'll keep looking at work stuff. So I turn off my phone and I leave in another room. And I've had periods of my life where I've been so addicted to work that I've literally put my laptop in the glove compartment of my car and then come back into the house. Because if it was in the house, I'd go to it and open it up. But if it's in the car in a cool garage, I'm not gonna walk out there to open it up. Um, so 
once the person understands it might be helpful for them to take a rest, then don't just assume you're going to use willpower, rig the environment so that you can't do the things that you would do um, if your device was there. Because I'm assuming it's like a device thing, right? Pick up the computer, pick up the phone, what have you. You're talking my language, Brad, when you use the word environment, because all the people I admire in psychology that I interview always say you got to work harder on your environment. Than you yeah, do. I mean, it's the same thing with food. Like if you've got, you know, Doritos everywhere, you're going to eat Doritos. So if you've got your cell phone with email on it, you're going to check your email. Absolutely. I do took email off my phone. I don't have any email, social media, any of it, because I'm like, talk about an area where I would struggle. If I have that stuff on my phone, I'm just constantly scrolling and checking it. So I had to take it off my phone and you know what, maybe I do miss some opportunities because of it. Cause I don't quickly respond or I don't quickly see a tweet that I'm going to get a bunch of followers or whatever, but I'm willing to live with that cost because the benefit is that I can be more present for the things that I'm doing because I'm not always working. Right. So what I've done is I'm, I'm going to be getting all of it off my phone starting in June, but for now I just have all my notifications turned off. So it's on. Yeah, it's funny. So I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a similar path. Maybe I'm like a month or two ahead. So I tried that but I would still open the app and start checking stuff. So eventually I just bit the bullet and I said, you know what, I'm gonna take all this stuff off, knowing again that I'm gonna miss out on some real opportunities, but the cost of missing out, I felt that the benefit was greater. And I can tell you, AJ, like I haven't really missed out on much because like we think that we gotta respond immediately, but we're not transplant surgeons. Most things can wait a day or two. I love it. Patty says, oh, excuse me, Dina says, do you have a sleep chapter in your book? I do. Um, so in my book, Peak Performance, there is a there is an entire chapter on sleep. Um, so that's the short answer to that question. Um, and that chapter details the science around sleep, um, as well as some like pretty concrete practices uh, that can help. And I'll share one thing, I don't want to go into it, because I could talk about it for hours. But one kind of paradox that surprised me in researching for the book is, uh oh, I think I froze. No, you're Hold still on. okay. You're okay. I can still see you. I'm back. I'm back. Um, something that surprised me in researching for the book is that a lot of the things that we think help us sleep actually get in the way. So like having a sleep tracker, you assume that that would help you sleep, but it actually hurts a lot of people because you become so obsessed and focused about the sleep tracker that it makes it hard to fall asleep. That's funny. So like I got to sleep a certain amount of hours or else I'm, you know, off. And then of course you're not going to sleep well because you're freaking out about it. We had a question that was written in by Dana. In coaching elite athletes, do you recommend nose breathing? And if so, how do you teach it? All right. So the short answer is no. Um, in terms of when you are doing physical activity, um, I don't really care if you're breathing out of your mouth or your nose. I've yet to see, it's a trendy thing for sure. I've yet to see any evidence that it actually makes a difference on performance. Um, the way that I like to think about it is our bodies have been programmed by thousands of years of evolution to do what is most efficient for them when they're moving. Like that's why we're alive as a species because we had to outrun lions and tigers on the savanna. So your body's gonna breathe exactly how it wants to breathe. So if for you, that means breathing out of your mouth, breathe out of your mouth. If it means breathing out of your nose, breathe out of your nose. Now during meditation, it's very different because there you do want to bring conscious, effortful attention to the breath and breathing through your nose can help with that. But when you're pushing your body to the limit, you don't want to be thinking about anything. Just let your body do what evolution designed your body to do. Um, I work with one uh, exercise physiologist who says that the only thing that nose breathing, nose breathing teaches you how to do is to feel like you're starving for air. So if you want to train being good at feeling like you're starving for air, great, nose breathe. But otherwise, no need to. That's a good question from Gina. Uh, what is the best way for me to become a coach? I love helping and mentoring. So um, first off, it's great that you love helping and mentoring because we the world needs more people that love helping and mentoring. Um, I would just start offering to do it on a like, pro bono voluntary basis. So I never charged my first clients because I didn't know what I was doing. I was making it up as I went. Um, so look for opportunities in your local school system. Um, look for people in your network. Ask them if they want to set aside just an hour of time, a couple times a month where you're totally present for them to help them with their challenges. 
Um, and that's how you build the coaching muscle. Do you ever train coaches? Do I ever coach coaches? Um, I've coached one coach, but I don't do like big, you know, trainings on how to be a coach. Um, it was much more of just an intimate one-on-one -on -one, uh, engagement with that person. What do you do for fun? And I, I wonder how you and Judd became friends. You both have cats, I noticed. Yes, I love my cat. Um, I have two, like Judd. So what do I do for fun? Well, I have a two-year-old, um, and he's a lot of fun. So I used to have all these other things that I do, but now a lot of it is um, when I'm not working, I'm with my, my little guy. Um, but I love weight training. So I have a, like a weight training practice. Um, and then I'm just super intellectually curious. So I read a ton of books. Um, and I love good food. I don't do any, I'm gonna, it's like, um, it's probably worse than swearing on your shows to say, I don't do any cooking, but my wife loves cooking and is a wonderful cook. We're like very gender stereotype there. Um, so, um, we have a lot of fun. Like I like meal planning, but, um, but I love eating really good food too. We probably have another common connection. Do you know Rich Roll? I'm sure you know Rich. We were both on his podcast twice. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so we've been, we've been using a lot of recipes from Rich's cookbook during quarantine. And then also Shalane Flanagan, who's a runner, a friend of mine has a great cookbook. Um, but again, all I do is help like pick the foods and then my wife cooks. And now my son's helping. He's only two. So I have fun watching, but again, I'm a willpower person. As I said, I have none. Like I have to like remove my devices. So for me, if I were to cook, I'd just constantly be like picking at it as I go. So I really struggle with that. There'd be no dinner because I would have eaten it as I cooked. Here's the answer for you. An instant pot electric pressure cooker because you would- not Oh, you just shut the thing? That's great. You would not be able to open it to do that. That's for there sure. There you go. Yeah. So I don't know if you can answer this, but we'll give it a stab. Monica says, how do you get over empty nests when the kids are grown and gone? I don't know. My kids too. <laughs> so um, back to that quote I shared earlier, right? The, the things that you care about make you really vulnerable. So to really care about and love your kids and go all in on being a parent when they're gone, of course, it's going to be really hard. So I think the only advice I'd offer is don't judge yourself for feeling that way. Um, but um, yeah, and then maybe like talk to some other parents that are a few years ahead of you in that journey. Um, but yeah, my little guys too. And like, I'm already thinking like, geez, it's going to be hard when he goes to college. It's still 16 years from now. Who knows? College might not be a thing. Um, but eventually we'll move out uh, and that'll be hard. Wow. Well, I see you have the COVID-19 haircut that many people have these days. It's not by choice. There's not, the, the hair went away, but it was pre-COVID. <laughs> What's really funny, Brad, is so many of the people want to be on the show and they won't because, you know, they can't get a haircut. They're waiting. Really? Yeah, a few people have said, well, as soon as I can get a haircut, I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, tell them to put on a hat. But exactly. That's what hats are for. You know, I love what is the pinned post on your Twitter feed. And by the way, everything will be in the show notes for people to follow you and get your books. And it's probably already there now. But I love what you wrote. Some keys to high performance and high fulfillment. Don't worry too much about conventional success. Make the goal mastery, which knows no end. Surround yourself wisely. Care deeply, even if it makes you vulnerable. Ask for help. Face your fears. Eat and sleep well. Be patient. That's about... Oh, sums up our conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> see i don't just make i try to practice what i preach or at least like preach what i tweet um yeah like that's it you just came <laughs> up with a new thing practice <laughs> wait um that's it like that's the magic sauce none of that stuff's easy i mean i wish i could say like oh you know actually if you just take this supplement you'll feel great or you just take this you know i don't know elixir that you heard about on your favorite podcast you'll feel great but I've yet to come across that thing. Um, so it is, it's really those principles. And, and it's, it's this, I keep coming back to it because it's something I've been thinking about a lot, but it's mirroring these two things that society says are opposites, which is like really strong self-discipline with really strong self-compassion. Um, and it takes both to really make progress in meaningful endeavors. Um, yeah. So Wendy and Gina are saying, 
what uh, they're dying to know what is under read behind Brad. I, I don't know what they mean because maybe. I oh, can't. oh, there's there's a this is a friend got me this. It's a little um, it's like a little calligraphy thing that says read instead. Love and it's it. hanging above my bookshelf. Okay. And I, I, I could answer most questions with that. I love to read. <laughs> That's great. Here's, here's a good one on a physical activity. Caroline says, is it necessary to have a workout routine or can simply being an active person be enough physical activity for the body? So I think that it depends. Um, I think that if you are in a manual labor, so if you're doing construction or farming, um, then yeah, like you're getting enough physical activity, you don't necessarily need a routine. I think for people that have desk jobs, it is really helpful to have a routine. Now that routine doesn't have to be like going on a spin bike or a treadmill or going to the gym. That routine can be, I parked my car far away, I walk to the office. I work on the eighth floor, I never take the elevator, I take the steps and I walk back to my car. Um, that's better than nothing. So I, but I think it's, help, unless you're, unless the flow of your day is so naturally physical, I do think it's helpful to have a few anchors that you repeat every day. That can be going for the gym, it can be going for a run, it can be meeting up with your friends to go for a walk, but it can also just be movement throughout the day. Um, but again, unless you're in a very physically arduous job, it's helpful to have some, some staples that you do every day. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I really do love routines because I think when we talked earlier about inertia, I think routines can actually help you with inertia. Totally. And they get, and they get rid of like the friction point for most people is, well, do I start? And if you have a routine, it just becomes automatic. You start because that's what you do. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of routines. I've written a lot about routines. There's an entire section in peak performance on routines. Um, so routines are super powerful for that reason. I agree. I love them. That's why I don't like when I have to leave because I'm out of my routine. It's like, what do I do now? There's no instant pot. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I One of my more popular um, recent stories I wrote for Outside Magazine on routines and um, the line at the end that I, every once in a while I come up with a good creative line I came up with was the first rule is to have a routine and then the second rule is not to become too attached to it. That's great. Well, I love the line you came up with today. Practice what you tweet. Practice what you tweet. If, imagine if, well, actually, I don't know. If I was going to say, imagine if everyone practiced what they tweeted. Some people, yes, but other people, no. Like, keep yeah, it I, know, I know who you're talking about. So like, yeah. <laughs> we won't go there. That's hilarious. So Adina says, is reading, because you have that sign that says read, is reading better than audiobooks if both are a valid choice? Is it better than, is one better than the other in terms of absorption? Is, is having a book better than an ebook? He should love to know your opinion on this. So my opinion would be do what works for you. Um, whatever you enjoy the most and whatever is going to get you reading the most, do it. Now, if you're sitting down with a book, you can't really be multitasking because you're reading the book. If you're listening to an audio book, you can be cleaning, doing the dishes, running around. So one could make an argument that you're not going to have the same level of absorption that way. Um, but I would argue that any reading is better than no reading. Um, so whatever works for you. But, but it, for me, it's the audible that makes doing the dishes possible because I don't like cleaning or doing the dishes, but if I've got the nice book. Yeah, and you know what I would say? Like, they're not exclusive either. So maybe you listen to like the more of like the fun book or the book that if you zone out for two minutes, it's not the end of the world while you're exercising or doing the dishes or whatever. But, you know, if you're going to dive into a history of Buddhism or like St. Augustine, well, then maybe like that's the book you save for the couch when you're just focused on that. That's kind of what I do. I, li I, I, um, I listen to a bunch of podcasts, but when I'm reading, I just read because I struggle. Like I can't multitask, so I don't absorb it as well. That makes sense. Sylvan says, can you please elaborate on not getting attached to your routine? Yeah. So what I mean by not getting attached to your routine is if you become so attached to your routine that then something happens in your life where you can't do it then you become really fragile. So COVID's a great example, right? Like if you have to eat at this certain restaurant or you have to go to this certain gym and something happens unexpected that you can't, then you totally fall apart if you're completely addicted to your routine. So another way to say it is you have to be able to build some flexibility. in. So I'm such a creature of routine. I have the strongest routines like exercise, certain ways of eating, and I generally stick to them. 
But when I can't, I try, and it's hard, I try not to freak out about it. I try to be able to release from it and just go with the flow and then get back to the routine as soon as I can. Yeah, so it's good to have a plan, but you gotta also be flexible. Yeah, yep. Uh, there's a quote I really like. Um, I heard it from a yoga teacher a long time ago, but it applies to so much more than the body that, um, let me make sure I get this right. Strength without flexibility is rigidity but flexibility without strength is instability. Well, that's me. <laughs> yeah, but I think in life we need that, right? Like not forget the gym. In life, we have to be really strong and stick to our routines. Otherwise we're unstable. But if we're so attached to things that we can't ever change, we, we can become really rigid. I, because I love yoga because I love flexibility, but strength has eluded me so far. I'm the I opposite. Just, like the strength, because you're the weightlifter guy. Yeah, I'm the opposite. I'm not as flexible. Maybe we could just kind of like do a mind melt and you give me some of your strength. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I mean, I can do things like, like I could, you know, put my legs like this, go chest down, all these, but I can't lift anything. So we got to maybe put us in a centrifuge and see what happens. This is <laughs> so fun talking to you. Very easy to talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. So is everyone. So what words of wisdom can you leave us with, especially during these challenging times? I'm going to come back to something I said earlier. I think that there's that mantra that for when, whether it's in weight loss or anything, when you feel like you're, you're getting off the path or you're failing and you catch yourself ruminating or being really hard on yourself, um, just come back to, this is what's happening right now. I'm doing the best that I can. And then hopefully that snaps you out of the story into your head and into reality. So you can take the next action in a way that is productive and aligns with what you really value. I love that. At every moment, just you're doing the best you can. And that's, that's it. going to change from moment to moment. Yeah, I had a bracelet. Um, I lost it, unfortunately. It fell off that said, um, this is what is happening right now. Because um, that, that's, that's all that there is. I love it. I love it. Such a great outlook. So nice to meet you. And I'll never forget Practice what you tweet. I'm going to use that. That's a practice what you tweet. And um, for those guests that are still on, thank you for listening. Um, I do try to be pretty active in a voice of reason on Twitter. So um, you can find more there. I'm at B Stahlberg. Um, and then Chef AJ mentioned my books. And I had the chance to watch some of your older um, interviews on YouTube. So thank you for what you're doing. You're such a positive um, force for health and well-being in a lot of people's lives. So thank you. I really appreciate that. And I hope I get a chance to talk to you again. Thank all of you guys for being here. Please come back tomorrow. It's the last day of a double header. And they're both cooking demos at 10 o'clock live from the True North Health Center, Kathy Fisher. And at 1 p.m. all the way from Argentina, Dr. Gustavo Tolosa. I'm going to send uh, Judd a very nice email thanking him for referring you. And thanks so much, Brad. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.